So tonight I'm going to talk about the Eighth Commandment and then we're going to spend some time talking about uh, Catholic uh, piety and, and daily piety and that sort of thing. So uh, we'll start by saying the Te Deum, which is a very old prayer. I probably said it in opening one of these um, classes before. But, uh, and so we'll begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, I don't know that it's in there, but um, I'll try to say it so that you can hear. And it's a, it's a, I like the, the, this, this is a very good prayer. Yeah, if you have a prayer book, it should be in there because it's very ancient. We praise Thee, O God, we acknowledge Thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth, doth worship Thee and the Father everlasting. To Thee all angels, to Thee the heavens and all the powers therein. To, to Thee the cherubim and seraphim cry with unceasing voice. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, the heavens and the earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. Thee, the glorious choir of the apostles, thee, the admirable company of the prophets, thee, the white-robed army of martyrs, praise. Thee, the holy church throughout, the, throughout all the world, doth acknowledge. The Father of infinite majesty, thine adorable, true, and only Son, and the Holy Ghost, the paraclete. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. Thou, having taken upon thee to deliver man, didst not abhor the virgin's womb. Thou, having overcome the sting of death, didst open to believers the kingdom of heaven. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We beseech thee, therefore, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we bless thee, and we praise thy name forever, and world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, this day to keep us without sin. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, as we have hoped in thee. O Lord, in thee have I hoped. Let me never be confounded. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, as I said, I'm going to begin by talking about the Eighth Commandment. The Eighth Commandment is the one that says you shouldn't bear false witness against your neighbor. So basically the Eighth Commandment prohibits lying, but it also prohibits some other uh, activities and has some positive aspects, and so I want to try to elucidate those for you tonight. It is a very important commandment, and as with all the commandments, or most of the commandments, well, as with those commandments that discuss our relationship vis-a-vis -vis our neighbor, uh, it has a aspect that both um, prohibits certain conduct on our part, but also prohibits conduct of our neighbors against us. And so it not only uh, keeps us from doing something, but it also keeps our neighbor from doing something to us. So the commandment binds us not to injure others in speech, but it also binds others not to injure us. And so it's important from both perspectives for us. We hear in Psalm 115 that every man is a liar, and so we know that sins of the tongue are very prevalent. And we hear various times throughout Scripture that the tongue is the source of innumerable evil. And so we have to keep a guard over our speech. Now this commandment is specifically talking about not bearing false witness against our neighbor. And so at the outset we have to say who is our neighbor before we can decide what false speech is. So to whom are we not, or against whom are we not supposed to bear a false witness? Who is our neighbor? Well, uh, obviously it's not just our next door neighbor, and then we can talk about the guy who lives down the street. No, um, Christ tells us that our neighbor is he who needs our assistance. This is in Luke chapter 10, verse 36. He who needs our assistance, whether bound by ties of kindred or not, whether a fellow citizen or a stranger or a friend or an enemy. So, everybody, 
whether we like them or not, whether they live close to us or not, and whether we know who they are or not. All these people are our neighbors. And we are their neighbors, and so we can't bear false witness against them just as they can't bear false witness against us. And who else is our neighbor? We're our own neighbor, and so we can't bear false witness against ourselves either. So everybody's our neighbor, so we owe a duty under this commandment to everybody, including ourselves. So let's talk about what false witness is. Obviously, it includes false testimony, and that would be testimony given in court or out of court, um, sworn or not. It includes testimony given in favor of a neighbor as well. So we can't help somebody by perjury um, because we can never have recourse to lies or deception. Uh, just because we're helping somebody with our false speech doesn't make it okay to do so, to, to engage in, in false speech. The conduct is still prohibited. The location of the false testimony doesn't matter, as I said. This is prohibited both in and out of court. So we're not to deceive or to lie or commit perjury. And God prohibits all testimony that may inflict injury or injustice. So, as with all the commandments, we have to think about this in terms of practicality, I think, is, is maybe the, the best way to approach it. And that is, as you all can recognize now, what sorts of things do we need to be looking to curtail in our daily life and our dealings with other people? And what sorts of things should we be thinking about at the end of the night when we do our nightly examination of conscience before going to bed? What sorts of things do we need to wake up in the morning asking God's grace to not do during the day? And so I'm going to talk about some specific sorts of speech that are prohibited by this commandment. And some of these are things that we think about uh, and we can kind of notice, and some of them are a little bit more subtle, but they still require our attention because, you know, God wants us to be perfect. So the first is uh, detraction. So what is detraction? Detraction is exaggerating the faults of others. Uh, it would include giving publicity to the secret sin of anyone in an unnecessary place and time or before, or before persons who have no right to know. And it involves seriously injuring the reputation of another person. And so this is a very common sort of thing, right? Uh, we oftentimes do this for a number of reasons. Um, sometimes it's to tear somebody else down by injuring their reputation. Sometimes it's to try to build ourselves up by comparing ourselves to others and saying, uh, well, you know, I'm not as bad as that guy or something like that. And so it impinges not only on the Eighth Commandment uh, precisely, but also on the pride that we're trying to root out in ourselves. And so we have to put a special guard over our uh, speech for this and try to avoid sins of detraction. This also kind of uh, deals with the seal uh, that the priest has in the confessional, because the, obviously we're telling the priest our sins, he can't go and use those sins to detract us, to make known publicly all of our private faults. And we should kind of maybe use that as, as an example in our dealings with others, because it's clear that the people that we work with, or the people that, that we live with, or the people that we interact with, are going to have faults. And the more that we're around them, the more we're going to notice them. And um, that doesn't give us license to um, go around spreading those faults if they're otherwise people wouldn't know. Now, in terms of people that we deal with in the public life when we're married, uh, I think that obviously there's a bond between the spouses where when you go to work one day and your coworker does something tremendously stupid or annoying or something like that, obviously. Uh, to a certain degree, you'll need to vent to your spouse, perhaps. And so we should obviously be mindful of our speech, even when we're talking to our spouse about other people. But uh, that sort of thing is, is maybe a, something to consider, that your relationship with your spouse vis-a-vis -vis talking about other people is maybe different than if I just go and, and talk to someone else about them. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... It, yeah, there's there's something yeah there's something cathartic about it. Yeah, you know you're one one flesh and all that. 
Yeah, and now let me let me say this. Yeah, it's okay to vent, obviously, but you can't. Uh, you, you, you you would still want to avoid the same things. You know, the pridefulness and the the anger and the hatefulness and that sort of thing. Uh, you would want to obviously keep a guard on that. Clearly, you know, just because you're married doesn't give you license to sin in front of your spouse. Um, but yeah, so that's a good point. But you know, I'm just I wanted to throw that out there because I've I've heard priests talk about that, and I think it's an important thing to consider the relationship among spouses. I'm going to talk about that in a, in a few minutes, yeah. That's a great question. Uh, the second th uh, sort of speech that's prohibited is also pretty common, and it's something called calumny, which is making false representations about someone. So the best example of calumny is, is what the Jews and the Romans did to our Lord, right? They calumniated him and lied about him. Uh, and they lied about who he was in order to injure him. That's the, the most grave example of calumny that we could think of. But we have a tendency to do this in our lives as well, um, making false representations about people. Uh, particularly, you would think of this, both calumny and detraction in the context of gossiping. And so um, one way to root out these sorts of sins in the daily life is to um, avoid gossiping and just avoid talking about other people. The worst sort of calumny is directed against Catholic doctrine and its teachers. So you never want to find yourself in a situation where you're calumniating a priest or a bishop or uh, obviously the Holy Father. That's not a good position to be in. We are also not to extol the propagators of errors. So what that means is that people who are saying things that aren't true, people who are saying things that aren't Catholic, we shouldn't say that they're saying something good by saying something false. Okay? And it also includes we don't want to um, give someone accolades for doing something that is sinful. So I think I've talked about this before with you all. You don't want to appear to be um, aiding someone or congratulating someone on doing something that's sinful. And that's doubly true when people are saying things that are uh, not true and we know that they're not true because we're Catholic and we know truth. Yes? Doesn't that apply to uh, like attending weddings that you're not supportive of? Yeah, uh, Catholics are not to attend invalid marriages. So I was just having this conversation with my wife last night. Um, Catholics are not to, like if you know, like uh, let's say, I don't know, some all right, mythical person Jim is a Catholic and he's a friend of mine and he's fallen away from the church and he's getting married to a uh, Baptist. And uh, they're getting married in a Baptist church. And I know that Jim, my friend, doesn't have the permission of his bishop to get married outside of the church. I can't go to that wedding because I'm supporting a, in, an invalid marriage. And so that's something to keep, be mindful of. Um, now, there are certain degrees of relationship that may make that analysis a little bit more complicated. For example, if your own child was getting married outside of the Catholic church, you have to exercise prudence in your decision making in terms of you don't want to be the straw that co totally cuts them off from the church in terms of your being obstinate and uh, failing to understand them. But uh, we, we have a moral imperative to not support falsity. Can you support yes, um, that's... Yeah, if it's your child, you would definitely want to... Yeah. That's a good point. His point was for the, key, for the uh, microphone because it's a very good point. And that is that, you know, obviously this, this sort of thing doesn't happen in a vacuum. So you would have an actual conversation with the person before you just didn't show up at their wedding, right? Uh, so you might tell them, you know, look, I'm, I'm maybe I'm glad that you're happy, but obviously you know that I'm Catholic and I can't support your decision to do this. And you would want to be charitable in your uh, method of explaining that to them because, you know, what's our goal here? Our goal is to lead souls to the church and therefore to Christ. And so you're not going to do that uh, by biting their head off, but you might do that by being charitable and explaining to them what they may have not known. And that is that this is what the church teaches. And you could be the catalyst that causes them to say, wait a minute, maybe I do need to get my bishop's approval. Because they may not have known. Because uh, sometimes Catholics who actually know what the Catholic church teaches feels like a very small minority of us. Um, yeah. <laughs> It is ecumenical. It is a sin. Is it a sin if, say, a member of your family, a very close member, like a sister, is having a uh, child uh, baptized and 
she is she has been Catholic, but she's not anymore. She's fallen away from the church. And you're still going to church. And um, she wants you to do a reading at the baptismal mass that's at the Episcopalians. Okay. So you don't want to do it. You tell her you're not going to do it because there's lots of problems in the family. Everybody's mad at you. And so uh, finally the uh, father-in-law, whose wife has just recently died, comes up to you. This is a very specific hypothetical yeah. you're giving me. <laughs> I think in that case you have to say no. And here's why. I said yes. Well, <laughs> you're one of those Catholics who doesn't know, right? Um, so I, I mean, I think you're probably okay because up until now when I tell you this, you wouldn't have had any reason to know because no priest is going to tell you this. And that is that Catholics can't participate in Protestant worship like that. Okay? So you, can't, you couldn't do the reading. Now, you'd probably be okay actually going to that. It's the reading that gets you in trouble. Now, I understand the guy guilted you into it yes. by saying it's in honor of somebody, and so uh, you're probably not that bad off. But generally speaking, we can't engage in, in public worship with other, uh, with people of uh, Christian denominations or non Christians. But you had all these fights with all your other relatives your mother, your father, the sisters, the yeah. brothers, your family. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a question of prudence in that case. Um, I think, like I said, I think that in this case, since you didn't know that there's a, a teaching on this, you're probably okay. And if, it, if that same situation happens to rear its ugly head again, you obviously want to be charitable. Now, those, I would argue that in this case, they weren't exactly being fair to you by trying to guilt you into it, using a deceased person's memory as a thing to get you to participate in their uh, public worship. But in the future, maybe you could... I don't know, turn the tables on them and say, hey, why are you guilting me into this? You know, something like that. But uh, hopefully that won't raise its, ra have a situation again. So now, you can't look at it as an ecumenical move? No, that's not what ecumenism is. Ecu ecumenical, ecumenism means people converting to Catholicism. It doesn't mean us... Per <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny, that's what the church teaches. I know, I through my little Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. You don't bring... You, yeah. 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 If you want to read more about this, read a document called Mortalium Animus by Pope Pius XII. He talks all about true ecumenism, and he points out that it's been the constant teaching of the church that Catholics are not permitted to publicly worship with non-Catholics. Okay. What's that? We need not have a question. Okay. No. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And if you don't take part in the service? Buck, you have a point? If you don't take part, yes, that's, that would be a difference. What's your, what's your, yeah. Yeah, you could go, but you can't take part. Don't, don't read scripture or pray or preach or anything. Well, we can't go to their wedding, right? But you can sing. No, you could, you, you may be able to. You can participate. If everyone will please let me answer the question, I'd appreciate that. You don't want to give scandal, which is you don't want to give the impression that what they're doing is necessarily what you're doing. You don't want to give the impression that what they're doing is, is, is maybe the right thing to do, using those terms colloquially, okay? Um, now, uh, there are certain things like weddings. The weddings of Protestants are assumed to be valid marriages because they're marriages between Protestants. And so you could go to that. Uh, funerals for people that are non-Catholic, you could go to that. Uh, there's no problem there. Uh, you have to be careful about your level of participation and use prudence in deciding what your level of participation is. What we're talking about here tonight is truth, okay? Truth is not different for you than it is for me, than it is for Gene or Jerry. Truth is the same for everybody. And so there's an objective truth. And we believe as Catholics that we have the objective truth in Catholic worship. And so we, there's no necessity for Catholics to go outside of that to worship in any way. We have the Mass. I'm going to come to everybody with their hands raised. No need to keep them up. Um, so I'm not trying to say that negatively, and I know that's probably cause for concern for you all particularly. 
Um, so I would say, in your particular case, you need to exercise prudence in that. Um, now, even sometimes at Catholic churches, they'll sing songs that shouldn't be sung by Catholics, right? So you have to even use prudence sometimes at a Catholic Mass about which song you're going to sing or not. And so I would say that if you're at a uh, uh, some sort of Protestant church and they're saying psalms or reading uh, scripture or something like that, I mean, yes, read along, read the psalms, sing the song if it's okay. I personally went to a funeral and they started singing Amazing Grace, so I folded it up and put it back because that's not a Catholic song. Um, so you just use prudence in that regard. But there are certain things that are common to us all, right? We have a common... We have a common, uh, scripture is common to us, right? And so, as long as it's being, you know, properly interpreted. Now, the thing I would caution against is putting too much stock in the sermon that's given, obviously. And uh, you cannot receive communion in some other church other than the Catholic church. Um, Orthodox information. If nothing else is available. No. Yeah. Available, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a very, yeah, I'm guessing, is anyone here going to rush anytime soon? Okay. So we don't have to get into that exception. Um, yeah. So have I, have, I, have I kind of, the first thing I said sounded really harsh, and now I hope that I've given you, now I hope that I've given you the ex explanation behind it and given you kind of the parameters to use, okay? So I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, you walk in and they do something, you know, some wacky Protestant thing, and you say, no, this is crazy, I'm getting out. You know, you want to you be charitable to people, uh, especially with regard to the more sensitive times in life, funerals and weddings, especially when they involve family members. Um, but I would be real careful about participating, you know, going to a Sunday service at a Protestant church now, because you're going to give the impression you're going to cause some scandal by doing that. You're Catholic. You have nothing to gain by going to a Protestant church because we have the fullness here in the Catholic Church. Um, and so just be mindful of that. There may be some aspects of it are, that are okay, and that is the, you know, the Psalms and Scripture and some of the songs that they sing. Uh, but generally speaking, you need to be very careful about that. We can go to our church, like here and do Mass. <laughs> you could, but if you, were, if you were doing that... Our children are, you know, still Protestant. And, you know, you know we're going to go to things that they have sometimes. I'm, just, I'm sorry, but it is. I'm sorry. No, and that's a... That's a yeah, that, that's a different situation when you're talking about interactions with family members, okay? So first and foremost, make sure that you're meeting your Sunday obligation, okay, by going to Mass, Catholic Mass, and then consider what the activity is and, and whether you're going to cause scandal by attending it. So if it's a case-by-case -case basis. My thinking would be that if it's really becoming a situation where you're having some serious questions about your particular circumstances, you need to ask a priest about it. Obviously, I can't now cover every specific circumstance involved here. Which Protestant song should you sing and why? Um, you know, Unfortunately, that's you not... Know what the priest is going to say, depending on the priest you ask, right. which is bad. Right. You know, I think if you go to our priests here, you're going to get a pretty good answer about what you should do. So that would be my thing. So the general rule, again, is that Protestants are not to engage in public or, or Catholics are not to engage in public worship with Protestants. Right. Uh, and everyone starts singing it, you're supposed to stand up and say, hey, this no. is not a Catholic you song. Don't have to you just don't yeah. sing. You just don't sing. Yeah. I don't know which ones are Catholic songs and which are not. Yeah. 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 Here's the thing. It's not going to send you to hell singing a song you're not supposed to sing. <laughs> All right. I would say that I'm talking about my personal experience. I put a lot of hours every day into studying theology, so I think I can spot something that's heretical pretty quickly. And on eagle's wings, is everything right. bad and amazing grace? Now, for you, it's different, okay? Because you haven't done, engaged in the amount of study that I have. Amazing grace is not a Catholic song, because it talks about people being you know, wretched and things like that. Wretched, which is Calvinistic, and it talks about the fact that all of a sudden we have this act of salvation, right. which it is not an event. Right. So the theology behind Amazing Grace is false. Amazing Grace has become a secular hymn. It was right. even played in Star Trek. I mean, yeah. sounds good. Back off. <laughs> 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 I've been Catholic all my life. 
secular modernist mindset. Right. Everybody saved amazing grace. Right. And you have to remember this. this yeah. right. And it's bad theology. I want to say something else. I was a Presbyterian minister for 20 years. Um, I pastored two very large churches, one with over 1,000 members. And since I've become Catholic, I have been asked a dozen times to do either a wedding or a funeral. I had to say no. I've been asked by people I was very close to, people that I am still friends with, people that were dear to me, that I pastored for years, whose children grew up and now they wanted me to do the wedding. I've had uh, parents of children die, they wanted me to do their funeral. Since I've been Catholic, I've had to say no. Um, I had no doubts about the fact that I needed to say no, but it bothered me a whole lot um, because I knew those people, I've known them all their lives. And I knew, in, in my little heart of darkness, that I would do a better job and give those people more dignity and death than the person who actually ended up doing the funeral. And of course, I'm right. But <laughs> and, and that's not just selfish pride. And it really hurt me, because I, you know. Uh, but yet, it could have been used as a witness. I did attend the funeral. Fun. I did attend the funeral without participating. I was asked to, I said, well, if you can't do the sermon, can you do a eulogy? And I asked Father, and he said, uh, you know, you're walking a line there. Yeah, yeah. So I said no. Um, but it pained me a lot to have to say no to those people. Of course, I explained why, and they understood. But, but some of them were hurt and bothered. And, and some of those people that died, and some of those people's children who were getting married, were very important yeah. people to me hurt me um, to have to say no. This is not easy stuff. And Mark is a stickler for proper Catholic doctrine and belief. And everything he's saying is correct. But it's hard. And when I was coming, and I'm going to shut up in a minute. When I was <laughs> well, I believe it when I see it. And when I talked, <laughs> when I talked to Father about some of these issues with me, he said, this is not easy. This is not easy, especially for you. Like, yeah. It's not easy. So get that in your head. And let me use this example. I appreciate that, Gene, because that's a very good insight. That's exactly what I was going to say. Sometimes being Catholic, well, let me start broader. Sometimes being Christian means saying no to the world. A lot of times these days. And sometimes being Catholic means saying no to other people who call themselves Christian. Okay? I want you to remember that there are a ton of first and second century, third century, and fourth century martyrs who refused to do the very simple act of pinching incense to Caesar and they died for that. Because these are eternal circumstances we're dealing with. And so sometimes you have to say no, even though it's painful. Okay? So I think we had two other questions. Nate, did I answer you? Okay, withdrawn. Okay. Andy? Yes, uh I don't, ever since I was in the Navy, I told y'all all, I mean, I always considered myself in my heart Catholic. I even put Catholic on my dog tags in the Navy, even though I was non denominational, non baptized. It just was where my heart was, and my <laughs> head, I this after all these years. Well, 20 some odd years ago, there was a kid who used to play poker with us all the time, he used to drink beer, and you know, we raised a lot of cane back in those days, and this guy was one of us. Well, he got a DUI one day, and rather than face his family, Blew his brains out. Mm -hmm. Now, it's been my understanding that the sin of suicide is the one you forget about it, Panthers. No, 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 do not stop it. Do not pass go. Do not collect you hundred dollars. You go straight to hell. That's just. Am I wrong there? Yes. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, explain it to me. I always thought I, I wanted to know if I could go to that funeral. If, if they're not allowed to be buried on hallowed ground as a suicide. Since they're not allowed to be on hallowed ground, can I, as a Catholic, still attend services where, wherever they plant the guy? Well, they are allowed to be buried on hallowed ground, since first when? of all, since about 1970. Wow, I didn't know that. And yeah. the, the yeah. reasoning... Yeah. 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 And here's the, here's the reason why we uh, recognize that people who suicide aren't necessarily damned outright, and that is that uh, we recognize now with some advances that we've had in, in uh, psychological, look, you know, studying psychology and studying psychiatry that and so for someone to commit suicide, they clearly have some sort of very serious mental problem, whether it's immediate 
or whether it's something that's lingering over time. And so if you'll remember what I told you guys about, what we've all told you about mortal sin, part of that is kind of, you know, whether you're doing it with full consent of the will. And so if you're under some sort of psychosis or have some sort of mental problem and, and suicide, it's clear that you may have not had full consent of the will when you suicided, and so you may have some possibility for salvation there. Wow. they got some kind of ecumenical grand jury that determines this? Because I'm really confused now. No, this is Catholic teaching. I've got no idea. I mean, I yeah. always thought... I mean, I've seen movies about it, I've read books about it, I mean, like this guy, he, well, it was, suicide, yeah. he can't be buried in hallowed ground, and you say 1970, they changed all that? They didn't change it, I would say it was a progression in terms of understanding psychology, but... I would say that the one thing that's always been true is that if you kill yourself and the three characteristics of mortal sin are there, then you have in fact been damned. The thing that changed was modern psychology's realization that those things are present a lot less of the time than we thought was the case before 1970. Right. But the basic teaching itself is <laughs> Well, how would they determine that whether the guy... That's we don't think... That's the sin of hope. He's just a tremendous person to God and hope to God will take care of him. Right. Yeah. Sure. All right. Can I give you a question? Sure. Okay, we have the ecumenical services here. Right. Yeah. And we go to other churches and we participate with them. Yep. Uh, can you explain to them what the difference is? I can't explain that difference, no. Because I disagree with those ecumenical services. And so I can't explain them away, no. There's a question about these uh, so-called interfaith services like we have for Thanksgiving where the Jews and the, and the Methodists and all come to our church and pray. Jerry asked if I could explain those in light of what I said, and my answer is no, I can't explain those, and I disagree with them. No, and to believe that would be heresy. Well, no, no. I mean, some of the rules of the church <laughs> right. are man-made. What rules are you talking about? Like, when I was a child, you couldn't eat fish on Friday. Right. That was considered a sin. That's not a rule. I mean, that's a doctrine. Yeah, that's, that's a, that would be a, a, an ecclesiastical rule, yeah. Okay, you had to eat, chicken, uh, you had to eat fish on Friday. Right. Did. Okay. I don't understand about the songs because the songs could eventually, the, the people that decide the rules, the right. Maybe Well, here's the thing. Songs? No, that's not true. Here's the thing. Songs. Songs set forth religious truths. Okay. Songs are based in theological truths, and so songs that are based on actual theological truths, that would be Catholic songs, are always going to be okay. Songs that are based on things that aren't true are never going to be okay. All right? Because the theology determines the songs, just like the theology term determines the mass, the theology determines the worship, the theology determines the prayer. The doctrine informs the way that we believe, right? Lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of worship, and the law of worship is, or sorry, the law of belief is the law of prayer, and the law of prayer is the law of belief. They inform each other. Okay? So, obviously, an ecumenical council is not going to get together to decide which songs are okay. The councils and the popes determine what the doctrine is, and then songwriters write songs based on what the doctrine is. And so if they're writing songs that articulate the faith properly, those songs are good. If they, artic if they write songs that fail to adhere to the theology, then those songs are bad. Okay? We are talking about songs in church, right? right. Yes. Not all songs. Right. Songs in church. But listening to Three Dog Night is sinful. Okay. Right. Well, if, if listening to Metallica is a sin, then I've got a problem. <laughs> Right. Really pushing it, and we've all seen him worship, and, and even invite. We know the Episcopalian. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there's a lot going on with that. Yes, and keep in mind that he's the pope. Right. Um, he has the job of pastoring the entire world, mm -hmm. and so the things that the we are we can never pass judgment on the actions of the pope. We can say whether they appear to be prudential or not based on what we know about Catholic teaching, but we can't pass judgment on the Pope's actions. Um, the Pope did say, excuse me, when he was here in America, in, in New York, at an ecumenical service, he said that 
true ecumenism must be based, it can only be based on the apostolic faith. Right. Otherwise, we can't do it. Right. So he already he set the record straight. He just yeah, wants to reach out and friendship. He's right, and that's right. what the Pope does. We got to move on. We got to we got got to move on. He's a pastor, so he's doing what his yeah. function is. And he can right, do that. right. He's right. trying to bring people into the church, right? Right. right. And right. open the road for right. it. Right. But he's not without compromise. But he's not going to them head in hand and compromise. Right. Right. All right. Let's move on from that. All right. Don't sing. Just because it happens in a Catholic church doesn't mean that it's right. Can you use your own words? All right. Back to the Eighth Commandment. So we we're talking about calumny, and we're talking about the importance of truth and not spreading error. And uh, obviously that's very important. We should also not lend a willful ear or assent to those who spread calumniation or detract others. So, again, gossiping. We shouldn't be listening to people who are trying to tear down the reputations of other people. We shouldn't foment quarrels. We shouldn't say things that uh, are just for the purpose of making you know, people get angry with one another and try to fight one another. Uh, here's an interesting uh, thing to think about. We shouldn't flatter people. We shouldn't give insincere praise for people. Um, and here's another interesting thing to say, and I think that, I know, you know, I think we all do this from time to time, uh, and it's something to root out in our lives, and that is saying something negative about yourself in hopes of garnering a positive response from the person you're talking to. <laughs> that's, like, that's a false pride. It's lying about yourself. And it'd be like, uh, <laughs> that was going to sound really prideful. It'd be like if I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. And then I waited for all of you to say, oh, Mark, you clearly do. <laughs> It'd be like that. Here's an interesting one. Uh, <laughs> no, you're allowed to lie to your wife. No, you can't, you can't even lie to your wife. Sometime, somehow you have to find a way to tell her the truth. I would recommend dodging the question for a few minutes, getting far away, and then telling her, yes. Okay. Um, you can't. You can't praise the sins of others. We have kind of talked about that. And that's something that you're trying to avoid here, okay? Here's an interesting one that's something to keep in mind. Uh, James and I went to a retreat, actually, in Atlanta, and the priest talked about this a little bit. And that is that you can't tell a dying person that they're not in danger of death. Why is that? People need the last rites in order to go to heaven. People need to be, have a sac to be validly absolved by a priest by confessing their sins before they die so that they can go to heaven. And so if you lie to somebody and say, oh, no, you're fine, you're putting off for them the ability to get a priest there to receive the last rites. And so you have to be honest with people. Yeah. I, I think that also pertains to people who aren't Catholic. I mean... Oh, yes. It pertains to everybody. Well, right, but like the whole you're fine or whatever, like telling them you're going to die is necessarily going to bring them to the church to go to confession if they're not Catholic. But right. I think we tend to patronize older people and dying people. And yeah. Yeah, and, that, and it's like they deserve the dignity of their own truth and to pass the next life, however they right. choose. Yeah, and you're, we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're talking about a particular situation here where somebody is Catholic and you're lying to them. Now, you don't want to lie to anybody. These rules aren't just for our interaction with the Catholics. Yeah, great point, though. And that's something that our, our society, you know, we want to put off the bad stuff and not ever talk about it. We have a duty to be honest with people. Lies of every sort are prohibited, particularly lies about religion and attacks and slanders. Hypocrisy is forbidden. Simulation is forbidden. Simulation is basically lying through action. So if uh, it's like uh, on the cartoons, you know, the uh, uh, guy robs somebody, he runs this way, and the, you know, the, the animal chasing him, says, which way did he go? And instead of saying that way and lying, he points and lies. That's simulation, okay? Not a whole lot of difference. Um, so those are kind of the negative aspects. Those are the, those are the prohibitions of the Eighth Commandment. I keep wanting to say amendment too. I don't know why that is. <laughs> I don't even know what the Eighth Amendment is. What is the Eighth Amendment, Buck? Oh. I thought that was the. All right. It can be. Yeah. Um, so, what are the positive aspects of the Eighth Commandment? Witnesses must give truthful testimony. But uh, this comes around to I think it was your question earlier about. Um, 
You know, what if someone says, hey, I'm telling you this, keep it a secret, and then the next person comes around and says, what did that person tell you? We are not obliged to disclose truth at all times, and we have to use prudence. So, we, you know, we have a duty when someone says to keep it a secret, to keep it a secret. Um, and so we have to exercise prudence in that regard. Now, prudence, that is, saying the right thing at the right time, doing the right thing at the right time. That's prudence. Right. Yeah, and that's the other thing. If you have a duty, like I think some of you are in the healthcare profession, or like I'm a lawyer, so people tell me that sort of thing from time to time. I can't tell somebody. I mean, I don't have a duty to go to the authorities. My prudence is not saying anything. Uh, so prudence, you know, depends on your state in life. Um, so. I've reached the end of my talk on the Eighth Commandment, and let me end by admonishing you what the Roman Catechism admonishes, because once again, I've taken my talk from that. And that is, the best way to avoid lying and to avoid sins against the Eighth Commandment is to talk less. Now, since, a, since we actually had a woman say that it's tough for women to do that. <laughs> yes, and that, that's a great point. You know, I think, I don't know that, that that saying was around when the Roman Catechism was written, but I think that it's getting to that point. That is, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. If you can't say something true, don't say anything at all. Um, you know, if your wife asks you, do these jeans make me look fat, maybe you just act like, well, you don't act like you didn't hear because that's simulation, but maybe you just don't say anything. Yeah. All right, keep it in order. Stop the crosstalk. That includes you. I noticed, yeah. Okay, what's your point? Yeah. Yeah. If somebody says, does, does this outfit look good on me? You could always say, truthfully, it's okay, but I really like that one better. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't gain any points, I would say, with people by telling them the truth, you know, or by telling them a the lie. Yeah. 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 All right. Any questions about the Eighth Commandment? Yes. All right. Our, our one positive, as opposed to our 1,500 negatives, was that <laughs> the other person was a lot of us. And so as, as good Catholics, when we face a family member or ex-husband or whatever it might be, that is a, just a consummate liar, what, how, what's the best, you know, like, how do you, I mean, I guess about, how do you, how do you deal with that? When they're sitting there doing that eight, <coughs> I almost yeah. said amendment. Eighth commandment, when they're breaking it right there at you, and it's just part of who they are. I would say that there are two possible responses that I can think of. The first is to call them out on it, in an, out of charity, because we owe each other uh, what's called for, for, uh, a duty of fraternal correction. If we see somebody doing something wrong, we have a duty to tell them that they're doing something wrong in a charitable way, at the proper time, prudence, okay? Um, and so if it's the proper time, you could, you could call them out on it. Um, I'm guessing that in the situation you're talking about, the prudent thing to do would not be to do that because it's not going to help because you're talking about a specific ongoing relationship with somebody who you may not get along with anyway. And so I would say to meditate on the cal calumny and lies that our Lord had to endure during his passion and deal with them and accept them as a cross and offer them up for your salvation, the salvation of the souls in purgatory. And hey, that's actually a really simple and a great answer. Yeah, thank you. So, all right, so we'll end on the good answer. And now I'll talk about developing a daily prayer rule. Um, last week, everybody that was here got to share their experience from the Easter Vigil. And uh, I was really, uh, I really enjoyed listening to what all of you had to say about your experiences. Um, and I would say that it's important, I think Jerry mentioned this last week, it's important to keep in mind the sorts of emotional reactions and spiritual experiences you have when you're joining the church, because at some point uh, you're going to have to 
um, hearken back to those experiences and to remind yourself of how you felt when you were baptized or when you were confirmed uh, or when you received communion for the first time uh, in order to propel yourself to continue on with the spiritual life. Because the spiritual life is a daily sort of, uh, well, it's a, it's a difficult daily thing that we have to engage in every day. And every day we make a decision again that we're going to be good Catholics and we're going to follow Christ. And so every day, or several times a day, actually, we have to begin again. I heard a priest say when he was giving a talk on this, because I, and I want to say, I want to emphasize this. Beginning again is the most important thing about the spiritual life. Not falling into despair, not giving up, but beginning again. Anybody who's ever dieted knows that there's a thing that happens where uh, you're on a good diet and you're doing good, and then you have like a cheeseburger and you fall, and you have a cheeseburger, and then dinner comes around and you're like, well, I already had a cheeseburger, might as well have a little pizza. And the next day breakfast rolls around and you're like, uh, might as well have a donut, it's all gone to hell now. And so you fall completely off the wagon. The spiritual life is like that. If you let one of your particular prayers slip by, then you say, well, I didn't say my morning prayer, so I might as well skip the evening prayer. Maybe I'll start again tomorrow. Tomorrow rolls around and you're like, eh, I didn't do it yesterday. And you fall off the wagon. So you have to never fall into that sort of mindset. And that's much easier said than done. And so the, the virtue to, court, to, to bring about in yourself to help you to counteract that is this virtue of beginning again. I heard a priest uh, describe it as this. He said that when he was younger, he played tennis a lot with his brother. And his brother was very good at tennis. Uh, but he was not so good at tennis. But they would play tennis anyway. And they would go out on the tennis court and they would start and... Uh, Soon, very soon he would find himself down, you know, three games to none and he hadn't got any points. And so he would get the ball and he would say to his brother, all right, I'm warmed up now, now we start playing for real. And then they would start and he would find himself down several games, he had not gotten any points, and he would get the ball and he would say to his brother, okay, now we start for real this time. Now we're keeping score. That's what beginning again is in the spiritual life. Uh, every time we fall, we get back up again. Because the virtue is not in avoiding the falls. The virtue is in getting up from the falls. Okay? And so how do you do that? Well, you have to teach yourself to say what are called short ejaculatory prayers. Those are prayers, and in this case, particularly acts of contrition. And so when you notice that you've fallen, you notice that you've said the wrong thing. Maybe you find, oh, I just calumniated that person. Oh, I just engaged in gossip. Oh, I did it again. Whatever your habitual thing is you do, and we all do this. You have to say, Lord, have mercy on me and help me the next time to avoid it. And the first step in getting it, it, that, you'll, it, that you'll notice along the way is that you're actually noticing when you do it. Because sometimes you don't even notice. And instead of noticing, oh, I sinned again and falling into despair, you say, I sinned again and now I start again. I say an act of contrition for the venial sin that I've just committed, and I start again. And I ask for the grace to do better as I proceed forward. And so you never want to fall into despair, but you're always going to get back up. There's a saint who, who analogized, analogized this situation that we find ourselves in to this. And that is that uh, it's like a child who's learning to walk. And the father is leading the child along by the hand. And every time the father lets go, the child falls right on its face. And the father picks the child up and, be, and helps him to begin again. That's how God is with us. Every time he lets us go, we're going to fall. And yet he picks us back up again and begins again to lead us along by the hand. I think I'm just going to you're going to come to a point, too, where your free will, in other words, you're going to face that, that sin, and you're going to say, you're going to make a decision. I'm going to do it again. What am I going to do? Not do it again. Whatever it is. And that's when you have to have a realization It'll, it'll hit you upside the head. You know. uh, to slip to do it, you ask for strength and to not do it. And all of a sudden you receive that strength. And then it happens again and you, have, and you have to make that free will decision to say yes or no. Do I accept God's grace and not participate or do or say whatever it is? Because if I deliberately do it, okay, then I will certainly have sinned. And that has to be uh, expressed through perfection. Yeah. So 
you see how free will ties into this, and I've talked a lot about that. And it, it's, it's that decision point that comes up, and that's another tough part. What? <laughs> well, the, I would say the beginning difficulty is even getting yourself to be mindful enough of the presence of God to recognize that you have reached a decision point. I think that most of us, myself included, have not even advanced far enough in the spiritual life where we can even recognize that we're being presented with a choice to exercise our will in a good way or a bad way. And so I'm not talking about someone hands me a paper and says, uh, you can sign this and deny Christ, or you can burn it and, and be a good Catholic. It's not as black and white as that, is it? Um, I'm faced with a lot of decisions every day, as I expect we all are, where I can either say something really stupid in the, in the midst of a conversation, or, or I can not. And before I even recognize that I've done something or said something wrong, the conversation is over, and I'm back in my office, perhaps, thinking, oh, that, what was I thinking, saying that? And so, you know, we run into that. And so we want to uh, cultivate the presence of God to such an extent in our lives that we are um, being mindful of the fact that we're always in His presence, which is one of the ways to try to uh, recognize that we are constantly being uh, bombarded with decisions that we can make either properly or negatively. Um, so I want to talk about developing a rule of prayer throughout the day that looking at it from a, ma a macro, a broad perspective, uh, keeps us in the church, keeps us involved in the church, because we recognize the church is necessary for our salvation. It's necessary to die in a state of grace in order to go to heaven. It's necessary to go to confession, because we could die at any, any time. And so it's necessary to live habitually in a state of grace, because we want to have the final perseverance where when we die, either we, uh, we die because after we've gone to confession, or we're given the grace of being on a deathbed where we know we're about to die so that a priest can be brought to us. These are the real life things that we're dealing with. We're trying to make sure that we're in a state of grace because we could die at any time. Okay? No day is guaranteed to us. Even if we go to confession last Saturday, we can't be assured that we're going to make it to confession this coming Saturday. And so we can't rely on that. So we have to be habitually in a state of grace. And so we have to have a life of piety that is such that we are cognizant of our inferiority vis-a-vis -vis God and cognizant of his attempts to help us through his grace. Okay? And so, how do we get the grace of God? How do we get the grace necessary to stay in a state of grace? Because we have just talked about the idea that we can't walk ourselves. We need God's grace to lead us along. How do we get that grace? What? The sacraments. Anytime someone says, how do you get that grace? Your first answer should be sacraments. Prayer is secondary. Okay? The sacraments are where the grace comes from. Chief among those would be the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. Yeah, I thought you were talking about like just on a daily basis. Yeah. The well, the sacraments. Yeah. 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 So, the sacraments are how we get the grace. Okay? Particularly the Eucharist. Reception of the Eucharist, particularly the sacrament of confession, where we get the grace to battle against the sins that we confess, and we get the grace that helps us to stay in the state of grace. Uh, and the other sacraments are important too, but for our purposes now that we have received baptism and, and confirmation, the main ones we're looking at here are Eucharist and confession, or if we're married, living the marital life, because grace comes from that. So uh, Eucharist and confession, the sacraments, that's how we get grace. All graces that are poured out upon the world come as a result of the grace given to the world through the holy sacrifice of the Mass, because that's the representation of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which merited for us all grace. And so the Mass, you could say, is the uh, dispenser of all graces. So we want to live a life in a habitual state of grace which means we want to cultivate good habits and try to root out the bad habits. We want to try to root out our character flaws. And we want to maintain a state of grace so that we can die in a state of grace, because we could die any time. Okay? So what are some specific things that we can do to uh, make sure that we are living habitually in a state of grace? I already mentioned the two big ones, and that is go to confession and receive communion worthily. 
If you don't receive communion worthily, you bring down damnation upon yourself. So you definitely don't want to do that. And so you want to make sure that you're participating in the sacraments regularly. You want to make sure that you're going to confession at maybe every two weeks, at the most every month, but consider every two weeks, because you will also go to Mass every week. And if you are worthy at that point, you want to receive communion. And so we have to live our lives in reference to the sacraments. <coughs> that includes, you know, preparing adequately for communion through prayer, through confession, through meditation. And that process, if we're going to Mass on Sunday, begins on Saturday night or Saturday, thinking and meditating on communion, doing a very good examination of conscience since our last confession to make sure that we're in a proper state, properly disposed to receive communion. Because we want to make sure that we're receiving communion worthily. Uh, participating in the Mass in a meaningful way and not out of uh, habit. We don't want to receive communion out of habit. Okay? So the sacraments. What are some other things that we can do in the daily life? Now I'm going to, I'm going to talk about a list of things that I have. Uh, these are traditional modes of Catholic piety. And they're all ways to obtain grace. Okay? Um, and what I would suggest you do is think about what are you going to do every day? I, the, at the outset, I will say, don't try to overload yourself by you know, saying, every day I'm going to spend four hours in prayer. Because that is not going to work. And you're setting yourself up for disappointment. And that's the sort of disappointment I was talking about earlier, right? Where you're going to fall into despair because you're like, ah, I can't do this, and then you just give up. So you want to think of a meaningful and, um, you know, life of piety every day that, that is realistic for you and that you can add on to that over time or as your circumstances change. And you want to take into account your circumstances. But also take into account this. You can wake up earlier and go to bed later. And so you want to make time for prayer. Because as I've told you before, failure to pray for a day is probably a mortal sin. If you just fa utterly failed to pray, you've probably fallen into a state of mortal sin. Okay, so what are some things that we can do every day? And I'm going to tell you these things in hopes that later on you will meditate on them and decide for yourself, what, am, what is my daily plan of action? Okay? And I would recommend thinking about your plan, writing down some general times or times of day you're going to do these things, and stick with it. The rosary. The rosary is the most important prayer of the church that's not the Mass. And so you should definitely consider praying the rosary every day. Uh, it is a very good vocal prayer. It uh, keeps us attached to Our Lady, and we know that where Our Lady is, there is our Blessed Lord. And it is also a good mode of meditating on the life of Christ, especially the most important times in his life, his birth, uh, and his uh, passion, and his resurrection. And so we want to meditate on those things every day. The rosary really should probably be said every day. It takes about 20 minutes, and so that's a very reasonable amount of time to pray every day. Um, if you're doing other prayers, I would say, in lieu of the rosary, you should really consider praying the rosary instead of your other prayers. Okay. Um, so I, I, it's that important. Father McDonald has said before, and I agree with him, that you're never going to find somebody who prays the rosary every day falling away from the Catholic faith. And that's one of the things we're trying to prevent, falling away from the faith. It's just not going to happen. Our Lady is going to keep you in the faith if you pray the rosary every day and stay attached to her. So rosary, do not emphasize that enough. The most important prayer of the church outside of the Mass. Given to us directly, I would add, from Our Lady. Okay, so very important. Secondarily, I would say, and, and from here on, they're not going to be in any order. The rosary is first because it's most important. But from here on, they're not in order of importance or anything like that, okay? Um, so secondarily, I would say that uh, the divine office is a good prayer to consider saying. Because it lends itself to saying at certain times of the day. It has ready-made morning prayer and evening prayer, night prayer. If you're able to say the prayers in the middle of the day, it's just ready-made for that. And uh, depending on how you say it, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes at a clip. And so it's very reasonable. So even if you're not praying the whole thing, which would be not, not feasible for lay people uh, like us, consider adding at least portions of it in. I would say particularly the night prayer, or what's called Compline, because it takes about five minutes it includes an examination of conscience. It includes an act of contrition. 
Uh, it includes prayers for protection during the night and while we sleep and to help us rise the next day to be ready to face the challenges of the world. And so saying night prayer is at least a good start uh, to getting us along our way. Spiritual reading. I'm going to come back to this and give you some spiritual reading ideas, but spiritual reading is a very good thing because it helps us to maintain our uh, wherewithal if we read certain books and study um, our faith. And I'm going to give you a list of books here in a few minutes, okay? And I can email it to you all later. I'll email you the list of books that I'm going to give. Gospel reading. So, another thing to consider doing every day. Gospel reading. Meditating on the life of our Lord. Uh, and reading the gospel, not only reading it, but maybe studying a good Bible commentary. We can't hear you. Can't really? Hear too many people Please be quiet. Thank you. So, yeah, meditating on the gospel. Reading uh, Catholic Bible commentary on the gospel. I'm going to give you some references, reference books for that in a minute. So, gospel reading. Um, saying the Angelus. We said that at you all's retreat. That's a good prayer to say at noon because you're saying it with millions of other Catholics who are saying it at noon. Uh, and so it's a good prayer because it's the middle of the day. So maybe uh, set an alarm or something or you notice it's noon or thereabouts. Say the Angelus and maybe say an act of contrition. Think about how your morning went because if you're like me, by the time you get to the nighttime, uh, you may have forgotten. You may not be able to do a very good exam examination of conscience. So... Maybe say the Angelus, or during Easter time, you say the Regina Chaley. Right. Three times, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it takes like... What? Yeah, the bells go off and you hear it and everything. Uh, and you may, you know, you can say an Our Father with it. So you can make a little, you know, it literally, it doesn't even take five minutes. It takes like one minute. So you can make a, you know, two-minute uh, little prayer thing that you're doing there in the middle of the day and just being mindful of that. Um, daily Mass. We talked about Mass, but going to Daily Mass, that's an option for us. If you're able to make it to Daily Mass, you could. Or if you're not able to make it to Daily Mass, you could read the Daily Mass readings, at least, or read what the Mass is for the day. Uh, you could read the... I'm going to talk about that. So, you know, you could just generally try to stay in tune with the church calendar, where we're at in the year, what the season is, what's going on, and read the Mass and think about the Mass. If you needed a... Uh, every day you wanted to think of some uh, gospel passage to meditate on, you could use the gospel for the day's Mass and meditate on that. And that would, would serve as a pretty good basis for your gospel meditation for the day. Uh, an examination of conscience. I just mentioned maybe doing an examination in the middle of the day, but you definitely don't want to let a night pass uh, without doing an examination at the end of the day and then saying an act of contrition for your uh, falls during that day and asking for help the next day to do better, and maybe doing what's called a specific examination, that is having a specific thing that you're working on at any given time. So if you're now have listened to my talk on detraction and you have found that, oh, wait, I detract a lot, uh, that could be your specific thing, and every day you want to gauge, you know, what did I do today? Did I do better? Did I do worse? If you did better, you want to obviously thank God for his assistance in helping you. If you did worse, you want to ask for grace the next day to do better, and that sort of thing. So you want to progress. Saying the blessings before and after meals. That's an important thing to do. Uh, I mentioned before, short ejaculatory prayers. These could be anything. You could say, you know, uh, just whenever you think about it. Whenever you pass a crucifix, you might have some prayer that you say. Uh, whenever you see an image of Our Lady. Uh, here's a good one. Whenever somebody says something blasphemous, uh, you would say to yourself, uh, traditionally you would say, blessed be God, when someone says something blasphemous. Uh, and kind of reparation for, for their blasphemy. And if you do that, it seems like in our day and age you could have a full-time job. But, uh, you know, you want to be mindful of that. You want to be mindful of blasphemy and to uh, try to make reparation to Christ for that. Um, uh, in this connection, keep in mind that traditionally, if you ever heard the name of Christ, that is, if you heard his name, Jesus, you would bow your head. Uh, whether you're in the Mass or not, if you're wearing a hat, you would take your hat off when someone says it. Uh, his name is holy. It's a holy name. You, so you don't use it. You don't just say his name. You could say Christ in conversation a little bit more, but his name is holy. Christ is his title. Um, and so just be mindful of that. 
And so people will say his name blasphemous, blas, in, in blasphemy or they won't think about it. Or even our Blessed Mother. People will blaspheme her or the saints. So be mindful of that. Uh, you could cultivate a um, devotion to your guardian angel. And that's important to have. And that's a, a way of progressing on the spiritual life. There's a saint who has said to, every time he met somebody, he would first greet their guardian angel. And then he would greet them. Now, you want to be careful when you have um, devotions to guardian angels. Because some people tend to take it kind of new agey these days. Uh, you're never to name your guardian angel. Your guardian angel has a name. You're not the person who gave your guardian angel his or his name. Guardian angels aren't men or women, but you get my point. You don't refer to your guardian angel colloquially like that. God named your guardian angel, and you don't know your guardian angel's name, so don't give a name to your guardian angel. To name something means you have authority over it, and you don't have authority over your guardian angel. But you will ask, yeah. Well, you know, assuming that I make that I, that I, that I make the cut and achieve the kingdom of heaven, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm being totally serious. It's going to sound funny, but will I get introduced to this guardian angel? Probably. Yeah, I would think so. Because I owe him more beers than I've ever <laughs> left in my life. Yeah. I'm serious. I owe this guy a beer or yeah. lots, a lots of favors. Yeah, and you should, you know, you could thank your guardian angel. I mean, all, I mean, the, uh, this room right here is filled with our guardian angels now. Um, and, you know, if you have somebody who's sick in your family, you might ask your guardian angel to go watch over them. And so they're not our servants. We don't, we don't order them around, but we ask them for help. And we need to be mindful of their presence because we sometimes forget about it. Because I'm sure that it's not just true for you. I think we all owe our guardian angels a lot. It's just that you have reason to know about what you owe your guardian angel, whereas we may not, you know. Ask your guardian angel to get help. Don't let him get away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you might, uh, another thing, you might say novenas. There's particular novenas that lead up to particular seasons. We just ran into the Divine Mercy novena. Uh, pretty soon we're going to be running into the novena for Pentecost. And so, uh, in order to stay in tune with the church season, you might say particular novenas. Now, are these ones that are like printed out for us, the nine different days? Yes. Or do you do the one prayer nine days in a row? Depends on the novena. Um, some novenas are same prayer nine days in a row. Some novenas have different prayers each day. Um, I would just, you know, EWTN seems to have, as far as I can tell on their website, a really vast uh, library of novenas. So I would check those out. And it'll tell you, like, if it says day one, this, day two, that, yeah. If it just says one thing, then you would just say that one thing nine days in a row. And uh, if I hadn't already told Doug this, he would ask me, and that is, what do you do if you miss a day? You make it up the next day and you continue on, okay? Uh, you, you know, we're, we don't want to be pharisaical about these things, okay? All right. Uh, another idea, visits to the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, if you're around church or if you work downtown or what have you, if you have time, you can stop by the Adoration Chapel or the church, say a few prayers and be on your way. Just acknowledge the presence of uh, our Lord in the Eucharist. Um, another question? Sure. Um, I haven't done that yet, and I think one of my reasons is I'm very confused about how formal we behave around the host, and yet our relationship with God is so personal, so like whoever we are, it's their formality does seem a little bit like a pretense sometimes. And well, I would... Like at our, I'm almost done. No, go ahead. At our, at our retreat, for example, we learned that in front of the, the exposed host, we're supposed to get on our knees on the floor. Right. right. Is that what we do in there? Is that what yes. we do? I don't even know it's in there, but it's in there exposed, yeah. right? Yes. Good. Yeah. yeah. Anytime. You just said, you know, jump in there, say prayer, going about your merry way. That sounds sort of a little opposite of how I felt. And so that's a little confusing. No, I would say, I would, I would analogize it to this. <laughs> Christ is the king. Okay? Christ the king. And so you want to act around Christ the way you would a king. And so you, when you go into his presence, you make the proper and you show the proper respect. So anytime the host is exposed, you get down on both knees and then you get back up, right? Uh, and you generally stay kneeling. In the Adoration Chapel, a lot of people will sit in there. Uh, you know, obviously everybody can't kneel for an entire hour. If you're spending an hour in there, it's tough to kneel. I'm still relatively young, and when I kneel for an hour, I feel it. Uh, so for people who are a little bit older or maybe have knee injuries, it would be un unreasonable to expect them to kneel. But even if you're sitting there, you obviously don't want to sit like you would, you know, like if you and I are, you know, I guess probably me and Andy were out drinking a lot. Uh, you know, we wouldn't want to be around each other like slouched and stuff like that. And so you want to maintain a formality there. But 
you also want to recognize that unlike a temporal king, Christ knows everything about us. And so I don't think there's any, any necessity uh, to go in there and use a whole bunch of prayers that use thee and thou and thy and that sort of thing. Um, now, you may do that if, if you felt like you wanted to, but I don't think it's necessary. Uh, so I guess what I want to know are the respectful parameters. I don't want to, like if I was just been doing yard work and ran down at the Circle K and got a feeling and I'm on my first clothes, is that okay? I think that's okay. Now, you wouldn't go to mass. other people there who yeah. know better than me. You don't want to go to mass dress like that. Uh, but visit to the Blessed Sacrament, you're probably okay. You don't need to put on a suit to go to the Adoration Chapel. Um, I've gone in in flip-flops and shorts and that sort of thing. Um, but you still want to make the out, proper outward shows of respect. Okay? Here's the thing. Christ knew what he was getting himself into when he gave us the Eucharist. He knew that there were going to be tons of people who were going to deny him. He knew there were going to be people who received him unworthily. He took that chance when he gave us the Eucharist. Um, and, you know, he understands that where we're at. And so I would say that there's no need to put on airs around Christ because he knows when you're putting on airs. That doesn't mean that you don't show him respect. Obviously, you show him respect because he's the only one worthy of respect. Uh, but you don't have to put on airs, I would say. So when I say there are, you know, certain prayers you would say. So if you're going to pop in and pop out, you would pop in. Obviously, if you're in the Adoration Chapel, show the out proper outward forms of respect. If you're just going to be there for five minutes, I would suggest kneeling the entire time, saying, Our Father, a Hail Mary, a Glory Be, and then go. That would be a, that would be a, a sufficient visit to the Blessed Sacrament. Okay. All right, well, that, that makes it a lot less interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just really, uh, instead of just going into the main church, you would go up there to say a few prayers. I don't. I personally will go to the church, but... Um, it depends. If the church is locked, I know the code there, so I can go in there. Yeah, it's, there's a, just a zero. Is it a zero on the end? Zero on the front. Zero, two, four, five. I don't think they put that on yet. Zero, two, four, five. Okay. Zero, two, four, five. Okay. So if this is like any time, like the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, right? Yeah. Shoot on up there, say a prayer. Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be seven or eight, 24 hours a day. Right. Yeah. They go in for an hour. Yeah. It's supposed to be around the clock. Yeah. And there, there's. So what he was saying about going into the church, you know, it'd, it'd be more practical than trying to interrupt the people who are praying that hour. But yeah, if you got if that's all you've got, and the church is locked, and right. you want to step in, the large will. The so you can light yeah. a candle for someone in there as well. There's no, no not in there. Okay. There's this. I think there's this mis. There's a misconception that you, if you go to the adoration chapel, you have to stay there for an hour. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. Go in there for a few minutes and leave if that's all the time you got. There's no rule. What's that? Right. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. But you're right. Yeah, if you signed up for an hour, you should meet your obligation. If you're just stopping in, there's no requirement that you stay for an hour. You can go in and out. That's okay. You're doing what you can, right? Five minutes is better than nothing. Okay. Yeah, it is, yeah. Well, I mean, okay, like for instance, and I do go to the Adoration Chapel, but I mean, okay, when you go in, are you, I see people doing different things. Are you supposed to bow before you, are you kneel right there in the aisle? Are you kneel, you get down with little kneel on the you can do that. You can do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh -huh. I went into the center of the room. I got on both knees and about my head. If you're, he'll probably Before continue you on. But yeah, if you're, yeah. you got a bad knee or something like that, you may want to go on that one yeah. knee. Some people grab a hold of the chair next to them. I see some early ladies come in. Yeah. Uh, how, do you you to how do you want to get your respect there? Yeah, the, the proper thing to do is to be on both knees. Now, this is, you know, just like when you walk in the church before you get into the pew or when you cross the aisle, you genuflect on one knee. Okay? That's what you do when the host is in the tabernacle. When the host is exposed, you get on both knees. So if you went into the church while there was benediction for something and you noticed, oh, wait, uh, you know, he's there on the altar, then you would get on both knees in the church. Okay? So um, when you go into the adoration chapel, that's what you do. But the same rules apply. If you're the sort of person who, like many people, can't 
genuflect even on one knee. You can't be expected to get on both knees. That's doubly difficult, right? So then you would do what people do. They show some sign of respect according to their ability. They might bow. But I've seen, you know, people will go in there and, and you know, may, might prostrate all the way on the ground. Uh, it just depends on what, it's a personal piety thing. You're not going to do the wrong thing. Don't, don't get so hung up in exteriors that you're, not, that you're forgetting the interior. Well, what do you want to do what's right? Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, the, the right thing to do is to be on both knees and then get up. And, you know, what you would do is when you go in, you get on both knees, uh, you know, when you pass the center line and then you go to your pew and kneel down. Or, you know, that's, that would be the proper thing to do. And kneel at least for as long as you can before sitting in the chair or whatever. Yes, that's a good point. And I know she's, she's old school, so she's telling you right. It's generally prohibited for people to be crossing their legs while they're in church or in the Adoration Chapel. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so you don't want to be too, too casual. All right. All right, let's go on. So, mental prayer. Every day, maybe engage in some mental prayer. That could include, you know, the rosary could be considered mental prayer. Meditating on the Gospels and imagining maybe the, the Ignatian way of doing it is imagining that you're in the scene and the smells and that you're there with Christ or Our Lady or something like that. So, mental prayer. Generally about 15 minutes. This is the thing that's real easy to overshoot and to make yourself real mad with yourself. If you try to say, every day I'm going to do 15 minutes of mental prayer, 15 minutes seems like an eternity when you're trying to focus on one thing. And so you may want to start off small and say, I'm going to do five minutes of mental prayer until you build up your attention span because the, you know, you're going to sit there for a minute and after a minute you're going to be like, oh, you know, I got, I, yeah, I got to do a grocery list. I got this client I got to go see. Today's going to be awful. And so the best thing to do at that point is to say, oh, wait, that's the subject matter for my prayer. Lord, let me tell you about what I got planned today. Today I'm going to talk to this client. I know this guy is charged with murder, so he's going to be really mean. I hope he doesn't murder me. Wouldn't that be awful? Lord, you know. <laughs> that was my day today. I bet no one else here talked to an alleged murderer today. Uh, so, um, not today. Um, so yeah, I mean, you want to, you know, don't get down on yourself, but, you know, think about, you know, that's the, you know, Christ is interested in our lives. I mean, you know, and you might think about your day, like, this is what I'm going to do today. Um, you know, how am I going to deal with that? What if that guy does stab me? You know, what if he gets really mad, or be more realistic, what if, you know, this guy, what if he has a really bad attitude, you know? How am I going to react to that? Am I going to react to that by being really mean to him just because, you know, he's in jail and I'm out and I can do whatever I want? No. So you want to ask for, you know, you know, insight into how you should act with other people. And that's a good subject for mental prayer. And your distractions are going to probably be the thing that overwhelm your mental prayer. So it's best to maybe just latch on to them and talk to God about them. And so that is maybe a good response to you about what do you do in the Adoration Chapel. Talk to God about your life. Uh, and talk to him about his life if that's what comes up. But it's more often in the beginning that we're going to be selfish and we're going to talk about our well, lives. My mental distractions are usually ridiculous. Like, I mean, chicken and milk in the grocery store. I mean, I really think about the grocery store like lots every day. Wouldn't that, does it, wouldn't you say that that might generally lead you to consider your kids and you could yeah. then start talking to Christ about, you know, am I doing the right thing for my kids? Yeah, that sort of thing. And so you want to, you want to, you want to go, you know, wherever the men, you know, you want to talk to Christ. I mean, he's talking back to you. You just don't maybe recognize it all the time. And so you want to be present there and talk to him because he's interested in us. If he wasn't interested in us, he wouldn't be there, right? So, um, some other things. Mortifications and fasting. Uh, you know, limiting our television intake and media and reading the news because it just is garbage a lot of times and it's, you know, inhibiting our spiritual growth uh, because television is just an occasion for sin. Okay. Um, not eating meat on Fridays, being Catholic, that's what we're talking about, being Catholic, doing things that Catholics do. Um, on Saturday, Saturday is the day of our Blessed Mother, so you may make a special trip to the church and, uh, you know, you want to obviously pop in to uh, make your visit to the Blessed Sac Sacrament, and then maybe you walk over to Mary's altar and you maybe say a rosary or you say some prayers to Our Lady and you visit Our Lady, a good thing to do would be to consider, um, you know, your Saturday, making your Saturday visit to Our Lady's Chapel uh, around 3 o'clock, and then you can hit up confession. And so you've done a lot of things in one day with just maybe 30 minutes. Maybe you come to the church, you do a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, you just go and kneel in front of Our Lady's Chapel, and you say a rosary there, then you hit up confession, 
You do your penance, and in about 30 minutes, you've done a whole lot of activities for the day. And since Saturdays are days that we don't want to do anything, at least if you're like me, I don't even want to leave the house. Getting all that prayer done in 30 minutes is a big bonus. You know, I, I feel like I've accomplished a whole lot when I managed to do that on a Saturday. And so consider that. Uh, or at least do it you know, bi-weekly, like I said, when you're going to confession. Okay? Is the church open every day? It is. And is the Blessed Sacrament exposed? No, no, no. No, it's in the tabernacle. But, no, you know, I, I prefer to go in the church, to go to the tabernacle. I go to the I go to the church for adoration. I mean, just because he's not exposed doesn't mean he's not there. He's in the tabernacle. He's there, right. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, you can adore him in the tabernacle as yeah. well. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, last thing on in terms of living the Catholic life, uh, you know, a yearly retreat is an important thing to try to make time to go on a retreat. It's difficult, but it's it's somewhat necessary. And let me, before I get into this list of spiritual reading, I want to latch on to what Doug said there, and that is the idea of serving the church. Um, you know, it's not necessary that you be involved in some sort of ministry uh, because lay people don't engage in ministry. Lay people engage in apostolate. So we have an apostolate. Um, we have our own particular apostolate depending on our state in life. Our apostolate might be being nice to the people that we work with and giving a good Catholic example. That's our apostolate as lay people. Our apostolate as lay people is not um, proselytizing our faith unless obviously I am proselytizing you all because you have submitted yourself to my proselytization. But that's not what we do. We live our life as, a, as an example. It's not our role to go out there and debate heretics and try to convert schismatics back to the authority of the Holy Father. That's not our role. Our role is to live the Catholic life and when people ask us questions, we need to be informed enough to answer that. But we don't go out proselytizing people. Our mission in life, our apostolate, is living the Catholic life and worrying about our souls and the souls of those in our charge, our family and children and spouse and things. So that's our main mission, to save our soul. Sometimes that involves you know, doing things through the church, like uh, soup kitchen or whatever sort of things, like... Obviously, we're involved in an apostolate here with you all teaching you the faith. Um, any number of different apostolates through the church. Some people uh, participate in the Mass by doing various things like ushering. Uh, so some people you know, will have that as their apostolate. But uh, our main apostolate is living the life, uh, the Catholic life every day and uh, you know, making the Catholic message known in the world simply by being Catholic in the world. Okay. All right. So, any questions about these things? All right, now let me run. You started using the apostolate word. We use ministry around here a lot. But right. So what's yeah. Your, what's your point? Lay people don't engage in ministry. Only ordained people engage in ministry. Lay people engage in apostolate. I don't know why they got it all mixed up here, but they did. <laughs> We're not ministers. Lay people are not ministers. Ministry implies ordination. Ministry implies ordination. Yeah. So, we're not ministers. Forget about it. So you wouldn't want to go to this, like a prophet church and start saying, hey, y'all, come with me. You got it all wrong. You need to right. Me. That's not our role. In fact, in fact, we were specifically forbidden as lay people from publicly engaging heretics and schismatics and apostates in debate. Thank goodness, because I don't know. It's not our role. I guess that sets us apart from most of the rest of them. Right. <laughs> we're, we're forbidden from doing that. That's the role of, of the ordained. That's the role of, clerk, uh, I was, of I was, priests and no, bishops. I'm not saying I would do that. I'm just asking yeah. because I've seen other people from other denominations do stuff like that. And yeah. yeah, you defend the faith. You, there's a difference here. Notice, notice this difference. If someone asks you a question or if someone engages you in a debate one-on-one, -on -one, yes, you have to defend your faith. You would never go on TV, for example. Like, I could not go on TV. Even though I think I have a pretty healthy amount of Catholic knowledge, I couldn't go on TV and start publicly talking about what the church believes because I'm a layperson. That's not my place. Okay? 
All right, but in one-on-one -on -one conversation, obviously, yes. And I'm able to debate you all, former heretics, <laughs> uh, because you have submitted yourself to that, because I had the permission of a priest that to do it. That happened to my mother after she, got, after she got baptized and got first communion. Well, she'd been baptized Baptist, but after she converted and got her first communion, she became Catholic. And about a week later, Jehovah's Witness showed up at her door. She's like, well, come on in. <laughs> and about ten minutes later, going, oh, geez, look at the time. Boy, we sure got to go. I mean, how often does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me close up by talking about... No, she was, you know, Mom. Let, Cerise? Well, that's very good, and that's, that kind of talks about the idea of not detracting priests. Uh, and and it's, uh, you know, we shouldn't detract or calumniate the you know, religious things, and, and priests are religious things even if they happen to be bad priests. And it also raises a good point, and that is that um, you know, when people attack our faith to our face or around us, yeah, we should stand up for our faith. Well, that's something that we have to have kind of a standard response for because you're going to hear it about the priestly pedophilia thing. All right, let me give you guys some ideas of things to read. Uh, it's important to build a Catholic library in the home. And your Catholic library should consist of proper Catholic reading material. So I've broken these down into categories. Every Catholic house needs a catechism. Uh, because at some point you're going to think of something like, oh, I have an a question about that. I wonder what the answer is. 
and uh, you want to look it up. So I would recommend, obviously, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a smaller book called the Compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and that's like a question and answer sort of book. Obviously, I would highly recommend the Baltimore Catechism instead of either of those because it's going to be easier to use. And the Roman Catechism, which is what I've told you guys I use to prepare most of my talks. It's very readable as well. So in addition to a catechism, you're going to want to have some sort of scripture commentary because you never want to go just willy-nilly reading the Bible by yourself. That is a very dangerous thing to do. You're putting your faith in jeopardy by doing that. You need to have a Catholic understanding of scripture. In order to have a Catholic understanding of scripture, you have to have a good Catholic scripture commentary. So you can't just go down to Barnes & Noble and buy whichever Bible looks good to you. You need to have a Bible that's Catholic. And especially when you're talking about commentary, you need a Catholic commentary because you don't want to put your faith in jeopardy. There's a real, and there's, many of these are online, and a lot of them are old, and they're free, so they're online. There's something called the Haydock Bible Commentary that's very comprehensive, uh, and you can find that for free online. Just search for Haydock, H-A-Y-D-O-C-K. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas wrote a four-volume commentary on the Gospels. It's called the Catina Aurea, and it cites to a lot of the early church fathers, St. John Chrysostom, and, uh, and people like that. There's a really good set for devotional reading called the Navarre Bible that I highly recommend. It's put together by the Prelature of Opus Dei, and it has a lot of quotes about uh, in the commentary about the daily spiritual struggle and daily life and references, you know, historical references and notes about the books and things like that. It's very good. Of all of these, I would recommend buying that one uh, because it's pretty cheap. You can buy one volume at a time, so you might say, well, now I'm going to read uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew with commentary, and it's like 15 bucks, and so you could pick it up, and then when you get to uh, Mark, you could buy Mark, and you spend a little bit at a time. This is Navarre. Navarre Bible. Yeah, like eight volumes. Uh, uh, it has, they have commentary for every book in the Bible. Yeah. yeah. It's just, they, they sell big ones, and they sell small ones. Um, I put this here, but it's not really scripture commentary, but it's good fodder for meditation. That is the imitation of Christ. I think I talked about that the last time I talked, by Thomas Akempis. Uh, short meditations uh, about Christ and about our relationship with Christ. You're going to want to have some books on hagiography, that is the lives of the saints. Uh, traditionally, you'd look at maybe Butler's Lives of the Saints, or now that we live in the information age, you could sign up for like a daily email. They'll, my wife gets them, and they email her every morning uh, the life of some saint. And so you can, there's, uh, yeah, you can get daily info on saints. And it's interesting to read about our predecessors in the faith and you see some of the things that they went through and the things that they did. And that's a good way to find a saint that you have a special affinity for because you might read about one saint and you're like, well, their life is very similar to mine. I want to look more into them. And so that's a good way to be familiar with it. And there's thousands of saints. So. Um, and that leads me to talking about the writings of the saints. And I have a few books here, I'll just say, and I'm sure some of our uh, long-time Catholics in the room will recognize some of these and probably have an affinity for a particular book here that I mention. Uh, the History of a Soul by St. Therese, which I'm reading right now, and it's really uh, just an amazing book as far as I'm concerned. I can't recommend it enough uh, because even though she lived the life of a religious and she was like 15 years old when she entered the convent, I find such an affinity for her. And she's really, was it Pope, uh, maybe it was, I think it was Pope Pius the. 12th or something like that, that she was really the saint of the 20th century, and so uh, she was made a doctor of the church recently, so maybe read The History of a Soul. It's a short little book, and it's an autobiography. She wrote it about herself. It's really interesting. The Rule of St. Benedict, some people find that to be a useful book for attacking the daily life. I don't personally understand how they get a whole lot of that out of that, but some people do, and so you know maybe you're one of those people who might. I just didn't, but maybe you would. There's a long section about which psalm should be read on particular days, and I was just not, did not find that, that illustrated an important point about my daily spiritual struggle, but maybe you will. Uh, a very necessary book is The Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. It's an indispensable book in terms of putting together what your spiritual life is going to be like. You must read it. Every Catholic must read it. The Dialogue of St. Catherine of Siena, very interesting book. The Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, that has some good meditations in it, um, so it's a good book. A little bit difficult to read on your own, but 
uh, the meditations at the beginning are, are worthwhile. You would want to have a book on church history, and I have two that have impacted me in a meaningful way. The first I would recommend because it's very simple to read and it's necessary in order to combat a lot of things that you hear from pseudo-intellectuals, and it's a book called Seven Lies About Catholic History. And so it prepares you to argue back when people talk about how awful the Crusades were, about how terrible the persecution of Galileo, or about the Inquisition, wasn't that the worst thing that ever happened on earth? This book prepares you to tell them no. Seven lies, Seven lies about Catholic history. And the last name of the author is spelled M-O-C-Z-A-R. It's a necessary book. It's very short and it's very readable. It's not really complex. It's, so definitely read it. Another book um, is called How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization by Thomas Woods. It's not quite as indispensable, I don't think, as the seven lies about Catholic history, but it does really make you feel good about the history of the church because it talks about how the church developed the university systems and uh, basically developed modern science and so a lot of things like that. It's a very good book. You only need one book in your life on Mariology, and that is True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. If you have that book, you don't need any other books about the Blessed Virgin Mary. Your email is this list, right? What's that? I'll email you guys this list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> nah. Too <laughs> it's a good book, man. Uh, okay, prayer books, missals, and sa books on sacraments. A good prayer book is called Handbook of Prayers by a guy named James Socius, S-O-C-I-A-S. -S. It has a very good examination of conscience in there. It has the Stations of the Cross and everything you'd ever need. But if you have a missal like uh, you have, if you hold up your missal, that missal right there, which is the new missal for the, the new translation of the Mass, has basically everything that's in the Handbook of Prayers in it. And so if you have that missile, don't buy both. Just buy that missile. Okay? Uh, and she also has the other indispensable prayer book that I've heard good reviews on from people, and that is the Pieta prayer book. It's like, what, 99 cents? Yeah. In the bookstore. It's disorganized is the thing I don't like about it. But once you mark it up, I think it will be a good prayer book for you. Because there's no table of contents. You just got to read the thing and mark the... Every, everybody who has that book has, like, all these tabs in it. Yeah, so... Um, I have actually an app called the IPA to app. It has the calendar and all the prayer books. It has every book that I've mentioned here tonight is on the app. And if you have an iPad or an iPhone, it's 99 cents. It's called IPA to. It's the best Catholic app there is. Uh, I mentioned the third edition of the Roman Missal that she has. Um, you could get the 1962 Roman Missal if you have an affinity for the Tridentine Mass because it has various prayers in it and everything, Stations of the Cross. Various Catholic apps for the iPhone. Um, I mentioned the IPA to app. Um, there's a, a few Catholic uh, prayer book apps. If you get the IPA to app, that's the only app you need for your iPhone. I don't know if they have an Android one or not. But I-P-I-E-T-A, IPA to, very good app. Um, Oh, and there are other apps, you know, like uh, the Divine Office. There's apps for that, too. And it's a lot cheaper than the books. The books are like $140. $20 bucks for the app. Um, like I said earlier, you might want to include in your spiritual life the Divine Office. You can get that online. There's a little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary that is in the IPA to app, apparently. Um, here's a good book on confession. It's a book called Frequent Confession. It's called Frequent Confession, and the last name of the author is spelled B-A-U-R, and it's a book where the, it's all about, you know, what do you do when you go to confession every two weeks, because eventually you're not going to have mortal sins to confess, so how do you confess venial sin? That's what the book is about, and it's a good book about uh, devotional confessions, okay? Mm, let me come back to that, because I don't have a lot of recommendations. There's probably other people that might. Um, you want to have a book on the Mass because you want to understand the Mass better. How about a book called Understanding the Mass by uh, <laughs> Charles Belmonte. It's a very good book on understanding the Mass, uh, talking about the, the new Mass here. Very good book on that. If you want books on understanding the Tridentine Mass, see me privately and I will tell you. What are some other books that I find to be indispensable? 
there is a book called Life Everlasting by Reginald Garrigo Lagrange, whose writings are normally so complicated that no one in the world can understand them. But Life Everlasting is a very good book, and it's a book on the four last things, uh, death, judgment, heaven, hell. So if you want to read about the four last things, Life Everlasting is a book. And then, of course, I'll end by saying that um, papal writings are good things to read. Uh, encyclicals and, and other papal writings. And then also the, our, our current Holy Father's books on Jesus of Nazareth are very good books to read. Uh, they're moderately readable, meaning they're somewhat difficult at times, but they're very good. And they go into an analysis of... Uh, Basically, he's kind of trying to argue, it seems like a little bit against the historical critical method. So if biblical scholarship is your thing, this current Holy Father has you no, uh, he all sorted. He no, no, he wrote it while he was Pope, but he's not writing it as Pope. Right. 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 Uh, the spirit of the liturgy is good for somebody who wants, it's a little more challenging, I guess. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of critical, though. Scott Mott has got some very easy books that are very good, and they really bring out a connection with the scripture. Yeah. 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 Scott Hahn. Yeah. So that is um. Yes. Oh yes, that's a very good book. Yeah. If you're looking for a daily book to enhance your, I can't believe I forgot that one. If you're looking for a book to enhance your daily meditation. There's a series of seven books called In Conversation with God, and it has readings for every day. Francis Fernandez. Yes, Francis Fernandez. Thank you. I could have never remembered his name. And uh, seven, seven days, but it goes along with the day's readings. And so what you would do is you would read the readings for the Mass that day, and then you read this commentary or, or discussion of them. And it takes the readings and, and seeks to apply them to real life. And so it's a good book for meditation for the day. If you're attached to the 1962 Mass, there's a... Uh, book called Divine Intimacy that does the same thing. Can we order these books uh, to uh, a bookstore? You can get them on Amazon. Yes, or Amazon. You probably got a bunch of them right here. I got a lot of yeah. books. Yeah. 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 Plus, also, I guess we support our short Yeah. Yeah. So, Olivia? May I ask a Sure. Yeah. Yes. yeah, the Everlasting Man is a yeah. great book, but I would not, I would not call Chesterton easy. No, I wouldn't either. <laughs> All right, let me, let me end here, and then I'll cede the floor to Jerry. And that is by giving a word of caution, and I'm going to try to say this in a way that doesn't spark a further conversation about this. But I know it's not going to work. And that is that now that you're Catholic, you have to be concerned about not putting your faith in danger. And so you have to be concerned about which books you read. Okay? You need to read Catholic books. Okay? Now, there's no um, hard and fast way to determine whether a particular book is going to be a good book for a Catholic to read. Except to say this. There are so many books by saints and so many Catholic classics that are just... Everybody who is really Catholic recognizes it to be a Catholic, Catholic classic. So even though G.K. Chesterton is not a Catholic saint, everybody recognizes that his book on orthodoxy is orthodox. Okay? Um, so these books that I've recommended to you come from particular publishers, and that's the best way to say. So I would say to read books that are published by TAN publishers, um, above all, because they're, they have just a ton of books. You could never exhaust their library in your entire life, and every book they publish is going to be completely okay. It's going to be Catholic. These are faith-based books only, right? Right, yeah. 
Um, now, you, yes, I'm talking here particularly about books about the church and religion. I'm not going to recommend Angelus to <laughs> Tan, T-A-N. Tan books. If you stick with Tan books, you're always going to be doing good. And they have a series of books called Tan Classics, and they're just a bunch of these things. In fact, when I was preparing this list, I just went to their website and I looked at Tan Classics, and I thought, that's good, that's good, that's good. So you could just spend your entire rest of your life reading books by them, and you know you're okay. Don't put your faith in jeopardy. Even I do this from time to time. I fancy myself pretty smart in terms of theology, and sometimes I'll find that I've gotten myself in, in over my head, and I put my faith in jeopardy. I have to put the book or the paper or the website to the side because it's putting my faith in jeopardy. So don't be prideful in your book selections because one book can ruin you. There was, a, there was a saying I heard a priest say that one bad book can ruin an entire seminary of priests. <laughs> and so don't put your faith in jeopardy by thinking, uh, it'll be okay if I read this because, you know, I know what the church teaches. No. Yeah. I spend a lot of time every day studying what the church teaches, and even I can't do that. So don't do that, especially while you're young in the faith. Are you saying don't read fiction then? Yeah. No, I'll talk about fiction in a second. Uh, there's certain, there's certain authors, say, for example, certain authors that are censored by the church. Right. Cerise. Don't read <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you'll see books books become books in our common day in our day they become fads. There's this book like The Secret, or there's this book called The Shack, or there's these books by this Osteen fella. No, no, no. Don't put your faith in jeopardy. Read Catholic books. Don't think I can pick this and pick that. Read Catholic books. As for fiction. We have a duty to, you know, refrain from reading things that are immoral. So you need to, you know, obviously keep your reading in check in terms of, you know, not reading things that are immoral. George R. R. Martin. I think you're probably okay. I think you're.